So I'm here to give some insights about a nine year follow up study of colorectal cancer screening in Sweden. And hopefully, this, this will give us some clues about how we can improve compliance. To start, I want to give some background about the situation in Sweden. The health policy is a national level responsibility. And with this, the healthcare system is very centralized. There's li limited possibility for different patient or professional organizations to give guidelines. We do have population-based screening for cervical and breast cancer. And everybody, regardless of individual risk, is invited. And the actual screening procedure is the same for everyone. The screening is covered by the healthcare system, so there's no extra charge. But to date, the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden do not recommend correct cancer screening. But this is lack of due to lack of experiences on the population level. In our follow-up study, the non-participants seem to have an unhealthier lifestyle, generating higher incidences of both cancer and mortality compared with participants, but also compared with the matched gender population. Male gender, being unmarried, and having a low income increase the risk of non-participation. A personalized invitation with a nurse calling up to book the appointments did not increase the compliance. And also the distance to the screening center was not decisive. So at least in Sweden, we could centralize the screening centers to the hospitals. But why? Why do people not participate? Are there any potential, potential modifiable mechanisms behind? I also want to inform you that a screening program has recently started in the area of Stockholm, which you know is the capital of Sweden. We had a couple of questions. What is the compliance in an average risk Swedish population? Could different invitation routines affect the compliance? Are there factors specifically associated with non-participation? Is there a self-selection to screen? So why sigmoidoscopy then, you might think? Well, about 10 years ago, sigmoidoscopy was pretty hot. And this was due to the effect of mortality in old case control studies. And also due to the fact that sigmoidoscopy reaches about two thirds of all correctal cancer. It finds individuals with a high risk of proximal lesions. And also due to the fact that about 9% of the average risk population of 60 years have adenomas and probably will benefit from an endoscopy. But still, what is the effect on mortality with screening, screening sigmoidoscopies? Briefly, the study design. We randomly selected from the population-based register 2,060-year-olds and invited them to screening sigmoidoscopy. Half were randomized to be called up by a nurse to schedule the appointment, and half were asked to call themselves. We used up to 10 phone calls trying to reach the invitees in this group, and in this group we used two reminders. All sigmoidoscopies were in an outpatient setting, and everybody with an adenoma, suspected cancer, more than three hyperplastic polyps had a later colonoscopy. background factors you see here. We didn't use any questionnaires, but solely registers to find out different background factors. And also, in the follow-up, the registers to find out about the cancer and mortality incidences. Some of the registers we used, the total population register, we got information about the marital status, income data, were based on the tax returns and collected from the Register of Income and Wealth. Here we have the GeoDatabase 95, and that database gave us the exact map coordinates of the residences. And with this information, we could calculate the distance from the house to the screening center. And also we used the multi-generation register to get the uh, information of the first degree relatives. Hospital discharge register, you see, we have a lot of registers in Sweden. 
uh, we got information about the uh, diagnostic codes and also the um, time spent in hospital. Five years prior to the invitation. Cancer register, we have the information on all cancer occurrences within the invitees, but also in, in the first degree relatives, all the way back to 1958. And cause of death register, so, you know, the causes of death, but also the date. So, how many did come? 14 subjects were not invited due to their moved out. In total, 39% participated, 61 did not. And we did not find any difference in participation with the two kinds of invitation. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all these figures in details, but Male gender, I want to highlight, being a male gender, it was an increased risk of non-participation with an odds ratio of 1.27 relative to female. We have unmarried status, divorce status, also an increased risk as compared to being married and having a low income. Short breathing space, archipelago of Stockholm, Picture one. <laughs> we continue? Was that, that a cause for non yeah, Yes. <laughs> Being able to the boat instead. Yeah. <laughs> Regarding the risk for uh, participation, we have a decreased risk. If we lived in a real small village, as you see, I mean, compare this with New York City, it's pretty tough, but it's 0.72 as relative to living in the town. And with the town, Swedish measure is about 10,000. But also, it was a decreased risk of non-participation with the family history here of colorectal cancer. Archipelagos.com, picture two. <laughs> on the other hand, we did not see any effect on the distance nor hospitalizations, at least not if you're hospitalized up to 10 days prior to the invitation. Above 10 days, you can see here, there's a trend. It's not statistically significant. You might speculate about the hospitalizations. I mean, it could be that frequent hospital contacts, you feel that you're already taken care of. But on the other hand, we could also feel that you're you're loyal to your doctor and healthcare system, that's why you participate. So, don't really can make so many conclusions about that. The, the cancer register gave us in total 32 colorectal cancers. And among the participants in the follow up study, there were five. Three of them diagnosed at the screening. Among the non participants, there were 16 colorectal cancers in a follow-up. Three of them causing death within the study period. <coughs> Even though the figures are small, we did see a difference in the other cancers as well. Other GI cancer, lung cancer, smoking-related cancers. But if you can see here on the confidence intervals, on the incidence rate ratios, they're not statistically significant. Archipelago Stockholm, picture three. If you look at the mortality though, the picture is more clear. You can see here, all cause mortality, we have a mortality rate ratio of 2.4. Also, death by cancer, 1.9. Circulatory diseases, 2.3. Of course, you say. Of course they have an increased risk of cancer. They probably had cancer already when, when they were invited. That's why they died. But no. We excluded everybody with a cancer five years prior to the invitation as well. And it was even an increased risk of dying of cancer in the follow-up. If we compare with the matched general population of Sweden, most astonishing probably is a 50% decreased risk of all cause mortality among the participants. 
but also 40% decreased risk of death by cancer. They look pretty healthy compared to the mature general population, the participants. And circulatory diseases, you can see there's an increased risk, at least borderline, among the non-participants. Well, by using only register-based information on all invited, that's the good thing with registers, we say that we have uh, data more robust and not affected by bias. And also we have highlighted the problem with self-selection. Non-participants probably with an unhealthy lifestyle, higher risk of colorectal cancer, higher risk of mortality, they don't participate. They probably will benefit more of participating in screening. And this self-selection self -selection can attenuate the cost effectiveness, but on the other hand, this effect could be counteracted by a high compliance. Actually, the study gained a lot of traction internationally as well as nationally. But maybe more important, it blown up a resting debate on colorectal cancer and screening in Sweden. It's a hot potato in Sweden, as you know. It's not recommended by the healthcare system. So in a study I published in the Journal of the Swedish Medical Association, I got a lot of response and comments from the professionals. And I was encouraging new screening studies in Sweden because of all the registers we had. And also recently, just here in March, one year late, you can say, the government also Got, saw this study, and, and hopefully, since it now may be a governmental issue, at least at the moment, this will have a priority in the future. So how do we improve compliance? Well, to start, we need rigorous invitation routines. As I said, a more personalized invitation with a research nurse or a nurse, for that matter, calling up, doesn't seem to have any effect, but the, the social pressure from, from, the, from the centers might not be the way to get them. The reminders, though, was very important. 50% were participating after the first invitation, another 36% after the first invitation, and the last 40% after the second reminder. And we need to target the men, singles, and low-income individuals. But how? Internet, television campaigns? Or is it just lack of knowledge of colorectal cancer and screening? And this results in a lack of motivation to participate. We simply need more research on why. Why do higher risk people shun screening? After our follow up study, a screening program has started in the county of Stockholm. And this is with FOBT, Hemicults the old FOBT test. And we have a 62 participation rate, 62%. 11% of them after the reminder. About 2% are test positive and followed up with a colonoscopy. Everybody's invited by mail with a test kit and also with a posted return envelope. The general practitioners are well informed and positive to this program. So we, we see them as ambassadors. And currently, we are looking at the demography of the non-participants. Hopefully, this will help us to set together a focus group, trying to explore why. Gender, marital status, it's pretty hard factors to modify. <laughs> so hopefully, we will find other factors that can be tested in the randomized controlled trials within this program. But still, research cooperation, very welcome. Thank you.